Okay, so let's, uh, how, many of you were he- how many of you were not here last week? This isn't a reprimand at all. I just want to kind of, I'm going to do a little review from last week's. How many of you weren't able to be with us last week because you were doing uh, the, the Lord's work elsewhere? Okay, that's a good way to say it. So, um, see, more hands went up then. See, it's like, I was doing the Lord's work. He loves me. He wants me to sleep. Um, I want to do a little bit of... A little bit of work to catch us up. We're doing two weeks on, on eldership, and you say, what, is, what do the elders have to do with, with Palm Sunday? I've tried to make that segue all week, and that's why we kind of separated the two parts of the service today, because this is some teaching we need to go through, because we're going to start, we're, we're putting together a new slate of elders, and we're, we're actually reworking a lot of our, our bylaws and stuff, too, because you know sometimes bylaws and things are written in, in a church's early life, based on what you, what you know, and then you experience them, and we're not changing anything theologically or anything. We're just kind of going through going, what, what have we learned about, about elders and, and terms of elders and, and responsibilities and things like that that we can actually refine and, and in a healthy way uh, go through? And, and so we're having all these great, really, really great discussions, but that's something that we're doing. And, and the elders asked that we taught, teach for a couple weeks on this. So I want to um, start with this. I, I like how Matt Chan, and i got to tell you, last week's message and uh, really last week's message and a little bit of this week's message was really helped crafted by uh, uh, several lessons that Matt did, uh, a guy in Dallas, Jeremy Treat actually did a lot of research for for years, and um, just really did a really great uh, series on the church and what that's about. And so the whole idea of covenant relationship, although it does come from Scripture, he just really crafted that in a way I thought was really, was really cool, and, and I just want to make sure that that's, that's not understood, because I don't, I don't like to plagiarize it on, I'm not quoting exactly what quote what I quote is going to be up here. But last week, a lot of that had to do because it really impressed on my heart that we're in covenant relationship with each other. This is one thing he says. He says, he just, when Matt Chandler describes the church, he says, it's, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're informed by the Word of God, and we're held together by the grace of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. That's us, and what separates us from a country club or social club or the PTA is that we're held together by those things, that we're empowered by the Spirit, right? We're, we're held together, we're informed by the Word of God, and we are held together. I asked this question, what holds us together? Remember last week we asked that question. What is it that holds us together? We had all sorts of great things, but ultimately it's the grace that we've received. I've received a, 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 I've received a gift from the Lord that I could not do for myself. As hard as I, I try to work my way through it, right? And we all try to work our way. We think that, you know, work out your own salvation means have, having to work our way to heaven. As hard as we try to do that, it's really God's free gift that he's giving us. And that's exactly what I have in common with you. And that's why when you get to the bottom, when you get to the foot of the cross, folks, it is so level. You know? And, 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 our, and our world wants to put all these hierarchies in place, right? But, but ultimately... If, if I think that I'm somewhat better than you in the Lord because of, of, I get to stand up here or I do something, or we are all, it is so level at the foot of the cross because we have all been, we have all been saved by the blood of Jesus if, if, you've come to, if you've come to him. And that's what holds us together. I'm hearing the amen and where is she? Christine, you came walking in a few minutes ago. I haven't heard that amen for five months. Girl, stand up from Africa. So Christine is back and... Hannah, Isaiah was throwing a fit, and Hannah, we just couldn't get her out of the house this morning. So she's, you parents have no idea what, I'm just, what I just said, do you? Kids throwing a fit. You just, it's just, some days you just go, I'm going to study here at home and be at peace with my Lord. And, that's, and I want to tell you what, that can be a good day, you know, and that's all right, because God gave us those kids for those reasons sometimes. Uh, next week, in fact, tomorrow at, what, 4.30 or 5 is when the kids come in? Uh, Yanni Martin? So 4.30 or 5, if, you wanna, if you're not doing anything tomorrow afternoon, you want to the, go to the airport and, and surprise somebody, go out. I was going to put the news wire, but they read it. So uh, Yanni Martin will be there. They're getting in at 4.30 or 5 tomorrow at British Airways and from London. It's the only flight. So uh, come on out and, and, and welcome them if you want. And they're going to be with us all the way till June 15th. I think that their first Sunday, they're both going to be here, and I think we've got Martin scheduled to, to speak and, and probably do a little rap because Bruce, Bruce wants him to rap so bad he can barely stand it. Um, comes to my office the other day, Where, when's that rapper guy coming? How old are you, Bruce? Uh, yeah. Okay, that's, and, and that's not normally the question that's asked of me. 
when's the rapper guy coming? So Bruce has got his cowboy boots on waiting for this country rap to happen. And uh, I say he's coming from a different country, not, not the country. So um, anyway, so you'll, you're going you're to get to meet Yanni, Yanni and Martin. You're going to have some opportunities to, to get to know them. And, and they come back, and, and we need to pour into them, refresh them, invite them over for dinner. Just, you know, just embrace them. The first couple of weeks, though, we're going to give them just some time with family and just to kind of relax a little bit. So let's get back to the idea of covenant. So what separates us is this grace that we've been given now. Now, last week I, I talked about, we did a little wedding up here, um, and put that slide up here. We did a little mock wedding with Kai and Amanda, kind of getting them practiced up for what's going to happen later in, in July. And we gave Amanda, we asked her for her vows that she wrote, and it was all about, you know, I'm going to love you till the day I die, and for better or worse, richer or poorer. And we asked Kai for his, and we're going to do some more premarital counseling with Kai because his came out, his kind of came out as, is I'm willing to do this as long as you cook my dinner and do my ironing, and we're going to give this a shot for five years and see how it goes. And so one is contractual and one is covenantal. And, and they are very different types of relationships. One is you do something and I, I will then do something. But covenant is when um, is, is we don't demand this of each other, but rather we decide to become this for the other. It's about what I can become for you, not what you have done for me. Chandler says this, he says, remember that covenant begins with the premise of I'm going to become this for you. I hope and pray, he says, that there will be reci <laughs> yes, yeah, reciprocity. I said it right last week. But if there's not, if there's not, I'm still going to serve you in this way because I'm in covenant relationship with you. You may walk in here one Sunday and, you're, and you get a little miffed because you haven't been greeted. And I'm going to ask you, who did you greet? Because you're in covenant relationship. And that means some days you pour it all out there because other people have just been human. Forgive their imperfections, would you? We're in life together. And we're either in life together or we're not. And it was a willingness to stay at the table for God's glory. We also had a table at I didn't want to bring it out here. We talked about that, you know, oftentimes we go to churches and it's like, oh, I want to, want to, we want to get in, you know, uh, I'm going to, I don't like the music or I don't like this or I don't like the way they do this or I don't like the way he, he talks. Or, and, you know, we're, we're just willing to push away the, from the table because of, of our opinions or whatever. And what, what I think God's saying is, you know what, I've, I've brought you into this body is my bride. I've called the church my bride. I'm in covenant relationship with you. And within the church... That's what we expect, because, because that's what he did for us, you see. And so we come to the table, not, not willing and ready to push away the table with anything that happens, but because we're willing to stay there because I'm imperfect like you're imperfect. Let's talk about it. We had this great elders meeting earlier, and, and you know, we, at the end, we went, wow, we hope that the new slate of elders can sit here and duke it out like this in a nice, gentle way with each other. Not duke it out, but, you know, so we disagreed. We walk out there loving each other, not pushing away from the table. You must decide whether you approach the local church community as a consumer or as one participating in the covenant relationship. And that's going to mean you have to get out of your comfort zone. That's going to mean you have to do some things you don't want to do because someone's got to do it, right? It's because we're in covenant relationship. How many of you love doing everything you do around the house? Come on, guys, let me see it. And your wife goes, you know, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just tired today. Pick up your own darn laundry off the ground, Right? And so many people want to go in and they want, you know, what's, what's in it for me? When's my time? Guys, you know, uh, one of Chandler's things he says, he says, he says, guys from me all the time, when is it, when do I get my time? I have to be busy all the time. And he says, he says, it's simple. He says, you go to work all day and, and you work hard for your family. And you get home and, and you get home at 530 and from 530 to 830, that's the kid's time. 
And you get on the ground, you play with them, and you go play ball with them, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you just you give it to them. And then at, guess what? Guess whose time it is at 8.30? It's mama's time. Because mama ain't happy, nobody's happy, right? So you, mama's time, right? That's true. And if daddy's not happy, nobody's happy either. So, you, you know, you, you give it to them. And he said, they look at me and they say, well, when's my time? It's 5 o'clock in the morning before the kids wake up at 6.30. That's your time. Amen. He says, I know you don't like it, but he said, if you don't like it, guys, stay single. <laughs> but you know what? For guys, I want to tell you, sometimes we just have to man up and do it because that's what we've been called to do, Right? But this is covenant relationship. And it may be until we're 65, 80 years old till we go, finally. And it's not after she passes on. It's just finally, you know, we can have some time to ourselves. I'm not, you guys, come on, covenant relationship. I got to move on here. So, but if you value covenant relationship, then we need to practice it. We expect it and we invest in it, right? We're, we're in this together. Good Friday is a great example of, listen, it, in my earlier years in ministry, I would not have been at the table with the guys that I'm at the table with in Kirkland. I, I wouldn't have gone. My, my, my heritage would not have even allowed me to go and sit with these guys at the table and do this, which is a sad state. I'm so sorry if you're a new Christian. That sounds foreign. We, the world is changing, thank God, in that way. But you know what? When, when, I, when I go sit at the table, we realize that, you know what? You kind of believe this, and you guys practice We believe this, but we're going to unite on Jesus because we've both been saved by the blood of the Lamb. We're sitting here in grace together. I'm not moving. I'm not, I'm not leaving the table. And the reason we're not leaving the table is because we don't want you to leave the table with them either. And we want you guys to get to know each other. And so this Good Friday service is a way for us to, to go in and be at the table with all these different people and say, we're going kind of, to celebrate Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you, will you come and invest in some other people this week? Even if you've already got a movie planned on Friday? No, seriously. I'm just going to ask you, come, come and invest. Bring that to the table because it's for the sake of unity. Now, what does all this have to do with elders? has everything to do with elders, I believe, is because that's what the elders are there to protect for the church. We need to find elders that have a passion for embracing and protecting and living out this type of covenant relationship. And unfortunately, many of us speak out of pain when we're talking about our elders. We're, talk, we're speaking out of past pain. I just want to point us to Scripture and say, let's just speak out of Scripture today. I'm going to make one statement out from the beginning that will probably uh, not win me some friends, but I, I just, it's scriptural. I believe it is. But ECF has made the, the operative decision based on what we see Scripture as saying that the elders are men. Okay? It has nothing to do with equality. Hopefully I made that perfectly clear just a minute ago. We are all equal in Jesus. It has nothing to do with gifts and abilities. There are women in my life and in, 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 that I know that are so far more gifted and talented and just unbelievable teachers of the word than I am. Nothing to do with gifts and ability. It has everything to do with what we see as the role that men, that men have been asked to play. One guy says this, Just know, according to the word of God, that elders in the church are men, but they are the type of men women flourish under. And I would say, go on to add to this, that other men flourish under. And are not flourishing under, they are, and if they're not flourishing under them, they are the wrong men. It has nothing to do with the gift set. It has to do with design. It reminds me of, remember back in the, in the, uh, in the, in the Israelites, how many tribes were there originally? Twelve. Why was, why, which, which tribe was over the priesthood? Why? Because they were better than the tribe of Benjamin? Because they, why? God, God designed it that way. And I'll, so, I mean, that's kind of, I, I thought, wow, I heard that this week. I went, oh, that's kind of interesting. God has placed different things in different designs. And, and the other thing I'm going to say is this, that we're going to continue to study this as we have. And, and we're not, this is not a hill we're going to die on theologically, guys. There's a lot of other hills I'm going to die on theologically way before this. I've, I've read all sorts of things on, on both sides of this. 
And, and it's be something that it's gonna, we don't want it to challenge our unity in this church. But we're not going to also, we're not going to say that we're not going to be unified with another church that may make a different decision. Okay? Just want to get that out right now. All right. So there's several different scriptures that, that have to do with elders in, in, in the Bible. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Titus 1, 3 through 9. Hebrews 13. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 20. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. And I could even add more to that. But let's, we're going to start with some of those today. An elder, you, an elder cannot expect the flock to be living in covenant relationship if they're not willing to live out that covenant relationship as well. And so one of the things we said about covenant relationship, and the one reason we know it's so important in Scripture is because we find these 59 Scriptures that talk about one another. You guys were here last week. We, we went through this. There's some extra lists. I think I put them in the trash can over there. You're welcome to go through it later. 59 one another's that that are in the scripture that's saying, you know, you love one another, you encourage one another, and so it kind of gives us this framework which we, we, how, to, how to participate in this. And so we want the elders to be living out these one another's to, to us, but we also want us to be doing that the same with everybody else. First, first Peter 5 says this. Turn your Bibles over to 1 Peter 5, chapter 1. It says this. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, and not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So what we find, though, is, is first of all, that there's the shepherding that takes place. There's, there's three different, four different areas I would say we could say the, the elders role. And number one is to lead. We're to lead over the affairs of the church. They sit over watching and, and leading first with humility, first with servant, first with a servant's heart and a shepherd's heart. As we go back into Ezekiel, like we did last week, in it was chapter 34, Ezekiel talks about how how God was so displeased with the leaders over Israel at that time because they were after their own gain and they weren't serving the flock, they were serving themselves. He says, I want nothing to do with that. And then he lays out what the shepherds are to look like. And it wasn't for themselves. It was a willingness to die to self, sacrifice, and serve. If, if someone does not want to, to die to self, sacrifice, and serve, they, they, don't, they don't need to be an elder. Amen? Jesus says this in Matthew 25. He says, but Jesus called them to them and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over. So you know what's happening with the rulers right now. They're, they're, they're lording it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Followers of Jesus, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be the first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came, to be served, uh, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So many of us have experienced, and this is where you start talking out of your pain, some have been in church where elders operate off power trips. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sorry that, that sometimes that's, that comes out of their own pain. Sometimes it comes out of their own security issues or whatever it is. But that's not the way that, that God intended the church to be. That's not the way the role is that he intended it to be. He intended it to, first of all, be his servants. Number two would be shepherding. And it's a protection. We're, we're, protecting the, we're protecting the sheep from false teachers, according to Acts 20. We're given a protection from the evil one who wants to attack in several ways. It talks about how, how Satan is prowling around, waiting to devour. A protection from hurtful doctrines or beliefs. Guys, if I'm up here teaching something that's, that's not doctrinally correct or whatever, may they pull me in the room, and before they flog me, may they sit down and say, listen, this is where we think you went sideways. Just kidding on the flogging part. They don't really do that. So we go, wow, where's that in Scripture? I want to be an elder. So you care... <laughs> You can't. <laughs> John's going, yeah, go for the flogging. And, you, and then they, there's the other part of shepherding is they, they're caring for people by, by praying for the sick. James talks about that. What a sweet time to walk in with someone who's, who's called the elders in and to be able to take oil and anoint them in the name of Jesus with oil and to pray over them. And they're the care for the people in the church. And the third thing is that they teach Elders are supposed to be able to teach. Maybe not standing up here, but at least in a small group setting, they're supposed to be able to teach, 
teach doctrine, teach sound doctrine, walk people through scripture, help them through things by teaching them. And number four is to equipping and investing in and pouring into the lives of others. We talked about this morning about wanting to make sure that we're raising up a generation of people, maybe through an elders and training program or something where we're raising up a generation of people who are ready for that. Because let me tell you what, my generation, how many of you are in my generation? I'm going to say how many of you guys are lying because I'm at the end of a generation. Okay, so my generation, let me tell you what we did. We said, I don't want anyone over me in my authority. I don't want anyone to have authority over me. And we walked away from our responsibilities. I, I know because I had these discussions with people. We, we, am I right? And a lot of us walked away early on and we said, we have no desire to even do that because there was no respect for the authority and it was my generation who did that. I am so grateful. These young ladies who stood up here are a group of, of 45 young people between two churches that are on fire for the Lord, that are loving what they're doing. They love the word of God. They love the truth of scripture. They are, they are wanting to be leaders in their families that they don't even have yet and they're are, are about to have, and they're wanting to be leaders in the church, and I'm going, finally, God, thank you so much, because my generation, we kind of messed up on that one, guys. Now, it's our, turn, it's our turn to now start mentoring them, right? It's not too late. It's just our turn. It's our time, right? Okay. Amen, Dave. Teach it. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the collective to say something. Good grief. Okay, so... We're going to go back now. We're going to look at two lists, all right? We're going to start with Timothy. I'm going to read through a little bit of Timothy. I'm going to read through a little Titus. I want to tell you, first of all, Timothy is, is probably 35 years old or so. He's, a, he's an evangelist in, in Ephesus. And Paul's going to give him some instructions because of some situations that are happening, with, like things like unity. The, the Gentiles are trying to figure out how to get together with the Jews because they're all Christians now, right? So we've got two different cultures, and they're kind of colliding in, in Ephesus. We've got a brand new evangelist, Titus, in Crete, who's got a brand new church that, that probably doesn't even have any older converts. They're probably all new converts. And we're going to see that he leaves things out of the list like they must, be, they must not be new converts. And, and I believe the reason he leaves that out of that list is because he's just realistically saying, if I leave this out, you can't have elders. And so within this framework of what we're saying, you have to, you have to look at things contextually. And, and what I've done, and, and what a lot of denominations, once again, this is coming out of my elders meeting earlier, so I can speak for several denominations that have, were represented there. What denominations have done is they've gone and said, these are going to be the hard and fast rules that we have established for our elders or elder board or whatever you want to call them. And what we looked at each other and went, you know what's great about being an independent church? We can just really do what we feel like Scripture is telling us to do kind of like that. And we don't have to have a sub, but we can, but, we're, but with that being said, we can also have some operational things like when we start talking about terms and things like that and how we, how we discuss that. We, because the Bible is silent on that and gives us the latitude with that, we can. But when it gets into what the Bible is actually saying, that's what we want to, we want to discuss today. So I want you to tell, tell you that these are qualities and characters that have, it, it's been a pattern of life, that it's coming out of life, that they've been transformed by God over a period of faithful living. I didn't say how many years, right? But, but they've been faithful in what they've, what they've been doing and, and pressing into the Lord. And it, it lives out Romans 12, 1, that I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And it, and it talks about a life that's being transformed by the Holy Spirit. All of you are being transformed by the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that? If I could go back and take a snapshot of some of you guys even a year ago, you would be amazed. You'd be amazed at the difference. And I'm not talking about, you know, you went on vacation, and boy, you gained 10 pounds. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you'd be amazed, you'd be amazed at what you see spiritually and the, and the, and the depth of which, from which you've come because of, of what you've experienced in life. It's part of your journey. So Timothy starts out like this, verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of the overseer, he desires a noble task. First of all, we see that they must aspire to this. This is not something that someone goes, I've never thought about that. That's never even crossed my mind before. But you know, now that you mention it, yeah, I'd like to do that. That's not, that, 
that's not who we're talking about, okay? Nothing wrong with that. First of all, guys, there's nothing good or bad. This isn't like this person's bad, this person's good. It's just, it's a preparation thing. Has God prepared them yet for that role or not? He desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be a live above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. And I'm using the, the English Standard Version for one reason today, well, for a couple, to give some of you some different perspective, but also for that verse. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive, because there are ways to keep your children submissive that are not dignified at all. Okay? So the idea isn't, isn't to beat them into submission. The idea is with dignity, with dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders that he may not, they may not fall into grace and into the snare of the devil. One more verse. Titus chapter 1, 5 through 9. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or, or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable. Take a breath. A lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who, are, who contradict it. He must also have a telephone booth very closely that at any moment of the day he can jump in and change clothes and come out with an S on his chest and be super elder for the rest of the day, right? So, I mean, that's when, when I read this sometimes, that's what I feel like. You know, and, and I think sometimes you read this and go, there is no way everyone, there's no way anyone can do that all the time. And I would probably agree with you on that. But is it what they're striving for? Is it who they are in the fabric of who God is making them into be? Is someone gone from, from being a very angry person to being tempered in that anger, and you see God at work with them. Not perfection, but these qualities of life. I like what Bill Fletcher said years ago. I've used this so many times. We may we make this a checklist of qualifications. We're really talking about qualities that God is building up and growing within people and transforming them into be, but that it is evident. It is evident. You have a sheet of paper that's in your bulletin. If you want to take that out real quickly, I'm not going to walk through every one of these, but this is something I want you to have that Jeff Whistler helped me put together this week. Um, I want to give him kudos for that. And it is, it is every verse in these two verses, right? In these two passages, it's every verse and every qualification. If you don't have one of these, raise your hand because we've got some extras and some people ready to pass them. All right, just keep those hands raised. I'm going to keep rolling here. So the first one you see is this desire to serve. And we've already pretty much talked about that, but just know that desire alone is, not, is never enough. This desire must be accompanied by the moral character and spiritual capability. It's a willingness to die to self. The second thing, and these are situational, so they're going to break these down into five, four different kinds of, of qualities or, or, or qualifications. First is situational. Second is within the realm of family. And the, the third one is going to be uh, uh, morally, let's see, morally positive characteristics. And the last one are going to be morally negative, okay? So I'm going to fly through and hit some of the highlights on some of these, all right? So number one is a desire to serve. Number two is able to teach. I've already talked about that. Number three must not be a recent convert. This is where a lot of people go, well, it can't be a younger person. You've got to be, a, let's see, recent would be anything less than... Uh, uh, let's call it 40. Anyone over 40 can be an elder because sometime, so I remember someone said, respect your elders, and that meant old. So we got to have old, and we start having these little things that come in our life. We go, this is what this means, so therefore, so therefore, so therefore. What he said was not a recent convert. You won't find that once again um, in, in Titus. You find that in Timothy. And so let me tell you what. I know some, I know some people 
who have been in the Lord for five years, that are probably more mature in their faith and are probably more transformed in their lives than I know people who have been in the faith for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But you do too. That's not, that's not really that much surprise when you sit back and look at this. I will remind you that Timothy was probably 35, maybe. I'm not sure Titus' age, younger than that. Uh, Jesus was 33, by the way, when he died. Just throw that out. So where we get the, like, the 40 thing, I mean, what we're trying to do is say, we're not, we're not necessarily out there looking, oh, we need, now we need someone from this generation. We're just saying we're trying to be open for what God's got open for us, and so not a recent convert. Maturity. Well thought out by outsiders. What happens if we go, uh, what happens if we go to your workplace and we say, what do you think about this guy? You know? What do you think about Andy Catterall? Let me line them all up. Say, Andy, what do you think about Andy? I mean, I know his wife loves him. He's a good man, all right? But, I want, but, what, but in other words, is the life that's being lived out, is it being lived out consistently? Well thought out by others. Then there's family things. Manage, manage his, <laughs> he manages his own family well. Folks, let me tell you what. If, if someone can manage their family, if someone is to manage the church well, this is kind of this proving ground of, of, listen, if they're managing their family well, if they can't manage their family well, if they're not engaged and they're not in tune with it and they're not putting time in it, it's just not, an, it's just not what they're, we cannot, we cannot expect them to help manage the affairs of the church. We can sure help them, maybe manage, work on some family things, but we can't put them over the affairs of the church. A husband of one wife. This is where you, you, have to, you have to really get in. The way that's really translated is a, a one-woman man. That sounds good. Right? Guys, you kind of get swagger with that one. Like, I'm a one-woman man. Yeah, you know, so, and ple- people go in there and say, well, this is a polygamy issue. Well, polygamy really wasn't that much of an issue in this culture at that time. Although it was still, it was still out there. So we have to be careful we don't say, well, it's just with polygamy. So you say, well, can anyone have... have been divorced, and then they go, well, we, no, we can't have anyone that's ever been divorced, like divorce is the unpardonable sin out there, just throw that one in, but, and so we, what he's saying is you're a one-woman man as you are in the Lord today, and you start kind of playing that out, that means a lot more than just, it means, it means faithful to your wife, faithful to your wife. And it doesn't make the hold that you must have been married before. So we are seriously looking at this going, can an elder be someone who is single? I believe, it, I believe they can. I believe they can. I don't think Scripture keeps us from that. Okay. Um, minimum age for the elder, there's, I've already talked about that. Let's go over to the moral positive. Above reproach. This requirement is not called for perfection, but for godliness. Basically, that are there areas of life you go, wow, that person, I could trust him with everything except the church's finances. I just can't do that. I would say that perfect person is probably not above reproach. You know, so it's, it's really, this really gets down to a trust factor of, of, of their life. Sober-minded. In the context of First, and, uh, First Timothy, it's best understood as referring to this mental sobriety. That is a mind that can think clearly and spiritually about important matters. Self-controlled. I think some of your scriptures will say temperate. Needs to be disciplined exercise of God's good judgment. It speaks to being prudent and sound-minded. Disciplined in our life. You know, disciplined with the different things that control our life. You know, are they, they, they like to work out, that's one thing. But if they gym all day because they can't wait, to, you know, that's, that's their God. A whole different thing. So it's, it's, it's that having a... A, a tempered way of life, self-control, respectable, respect in all areas of life, including your workplace, hospitable. Hospitable just doesn't mean being able to decorate during the certain times of the year and the formality that's considered appropriate for that community at that time. What that means is, um, that would be a good thing. Um, what that means is you have a love for people who don't know the Lord. Literally, when you get back into what that word actually means, 
It means loving people. You're looking for opportunities to, to minister to people, to, to speak with people. You're not afraid. Oh, I can't have my my house because they don't know the Lord. I mean, none of that. I mean, it's like, please come in. Please come in. Gentle, gracious, and kind and forbearing. A lover of good. Willingness to help others. Upright. Also translated just or righteous. Another way to say this would be to intentionally live according to God's word. A tendency to make fair and, 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 and right decisions. Holy. Being set apart for, for God and his word. Realizing that their actions will give glory to God. And being unashamed about being holy in, an un, in, a, holy, in a holy and an unholy world. And then disciplined. Also, also similar to the self-controlled. Discipline in all aspects of life. They're not lazy. They're, 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 they know their responsibilities and they, and they go for it. And finally, the, the last ones are not a drunkard. Most of, your, most of the Bibles will say not addicted to too much wine. Okay? So and now we, we, we can, I think we can safely say that's an addiction to other things as well. So we've got to kind of move through that. Does it say don't drink wine? No, it doesn't say don't drink wine. Timothy Paul told Timothy, go have a little wine for your stomach. So, and we're not talking about glass of wine with dinner. We're talking about a need to drink in excess. Okay? So that's what he's talking about. Not violent. I think that would go, you know, that you would think some of these would be like a given. Like, yeah, we don't want a violent person leading us. Like, <laughs> your way out, we're going to flog you on the way out today. Is everyone... You've been a bad person. No, I'm not bad. I'm just dead. God's saving me, though. So, not a lover of money. Paul talks in 1 Timothy 6 about the love of money and how it can end the destruction of a, faith, of, of a person's faith. It's not talking about people who, don't, who people can't make money. It's talking about, is, are they trying to serve God above, or trying to serve money above God? Generosity and serving money do not typically go hand in hand. Because one is not a willingness to let go and to live open-handedly in life. Elders need to have that heart of generosity. Not hoarding, but rather, rather using for God's purposes. Not arrogant. Not wanting, not wanting to be in a position in order to, to lord it over them, but, but wanting to be in this because they feel like God's called them to serve people in this way. And the lastly is, is not quick-tempered. The Bible's full of places about being slow to anger. Does that mean... Does that mean an elder is never supposed to be angry or is never angered or whatever? I think most of us, I've been in these meetings. We should all be out of there. No, we really don't get angry at each other. But you know, but, you know, but it's saying slow, not quick-tempered. That's not part of the fabric of who you are. Proverbs 29 says, A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. So if you take this, folks, and you take it in the context of living in, in covenant community, to me, it makes me read these differently because I look at this and I say, you know what? I wouldn't want to be led by someone who's, who's temperamental or I wouldn't want to be led by someone who's arrogant because I don't see how that plays into the idea that if I'm going to be in covenant community with you, I need to come to the table with what I have. And what I'd ask you to do this week is go and pray about this. We gave you this list for a reason. is to go and, and look at it and pray about it. If, if people come to your mind, that's one thing. We're not necessarily asking for a, a list, but if God puts someone in your heart that you feel like after reading and studying and going through this, then, then please let us know about that. What we're most concerned right now is that we just have this understanding that, that we're, we're asking these men to, to, to lead us as we do our best to live in, in covenant community with each other. Amen? Stand with me, please. Band, come up. I think we're going to do one, um, one song, or just a reprise after the prayer. Let's pray. Father, I know that there's um, there's been some loss in this family this week. Phyllis's mother, and I know that um, Joyce Treat lost her sister this week. Father, I don't, I don't want to make light of any of that. I know some other people are hurting because other family members are, are, are near death or really struggling 
uh, physically with things. And Father, we want to call on you as the divine healer at this point. I pray that you would visit them where they are and visit their hearts. God, I pray for those who we know that, um, that don't know the Lord. More than ever right now, it seems like um, I'm meeting people that are willing to talk And they're surprising me, obviously. They're surprising me because I I really thought maybe they wouldn't want to talk about that relationship, but they're open to that. And Father, I pray that you would continue to give us opportunities. I pray that every one of us this week would have just at least one opportunity to speak the name of Jesus into someone's life. And Father, let's just trust you and see what that yields. Father, I pray that you would bless this church as we go through this process um, of, of putting other men over this church in leadership to serve. I pray, Father, that you would humble those of us who are in leadership. Father, I pray very specifically for myself. You know my shortcomings. You know those, those ways the old guy keeps wanting to get out of the grave someday and, and take control of things. You know my struggles. Father, I pray that you'd keep refining me, sanctifying me in those areas. I pray we'd never be, we'd, we'd never be too good for you to come in and, and change our lives and to transform us. Father, I pray that this church would continue to stay healthy. God, I'm so thankful for all of our new brothers and sisters that have come in through the last several months, and I look out and see their faces, and I'm just so, so, so thankful that you've entrusted them to this church. God, may they now dig in and, and, and trust us to them and, and them to us. And Father, may we, uh, may we grow in fellowship with them. God, we bless your name today. We praise you for coming into the city to begin with, a city that you wept over. And then you came in and saved us all. Holy, holy, holy. And the church said,